Love and prayers for everyone going through a difficult time right now. Keep going. Shane McGowan, the iconic frontman of the Pogues, was nearing the end of his life, as Victoria Mary Clark indicated with those tweets and a picture of her husband lying in a hospital bed. This realization was shared by me. His passing yesterday, only two weeks after he was struck by a virus that caused encephalitis in December of last year, ends one of the liveliest musical and personal lives of the previous 40 years. He was unfortunately born on Christmas Day 1957 and grew up to be an integral element of the Achaean. Sung with the late Kirstie McColl, his song Fairy Tale of New York is the perfect counterpoint to the overly sentimental and sugar-coated holiday cheer. It's a sharp back and forth between two broken people whose hopes are doomed to fail. Shane Patrick Lysot McGowan, one of the greatest poets to emerge from the 1950s Irish emigration wave to England, was born in Pembury, in the southeast county of Hinn. His mother Therese, from Tipperary, worked as a typist in a convent, and his father Maurice, from Dublin, was employed as an office clerk at the C and A department store. The family returned to Ireland when Shane was still a baby and when he was five years old, they lived on a farm in Tipperary, and he was given two bottles of Guinness every day. Encircled by an extended musical family, he enjoyed life there, but his parents made the decision to move back to England, where the six-year-old kid would lie in bed at night, sobbing himself to sleep, thinking of Ireland. McGowan's were well-educated. His father had a strong anti-authoritarian streak and was well-versed in literature, while his mother was a skilled musician. He encouraged Shane's insatiable thirst for reading and introduced him to the classics far earlier than most kids could have. A Furious Devotion, the McGowan biography written by Richard Bowles, was later given a comprehensive account of this by Maurice. Together, we read and spoke about literature a lot, he remarked. We used to chuckle a lot at Joyce. I read one page of Finnegan's Wake, while he claimed to have read two. Then we both read aloud the funniest sections from Ulysses. We both liked the part in Finnegan's Wake where God was referred to as Gov. We had a good laugh over that and the line from Ulysses called K. Emria, Kiss My Royal Irish Arse. Ferris and I would read authors like Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh together, and he would do the same. We also liked Damon Runyon's Mobsters. We read Voltaire and Sartre, D. H. Lawrence, Dostoevsky, the brothers Kramazov, and Sean O'Casey. He had an extremely advanced reading age. This was all up until the age of 12. Up until the age of 12, Shane and I had a terrific intellectual match. After that, he moved on to more contemporary subjects and authors I found difficult, such Kinter Grass. Others who visited Ireland later noted the young Shane's intelligence as well. According to his cousin Michelle, who is also included in the biography, he was a softy. We used to chuckle at his gorgeous curly hair. He was simply a pleasure to take care of. Shane would occasionally read passages to me while we were playing games. At that point, I used to wonder, I didn't really understand what the hell that was about. I have to be able to read this, I thought to myself as I tried to get through Ulysses. I therefore made an effort to be as astute as this tiny prick. Returning to England, Shane enrolled in Holm Woodhouse Prep School in Langton Green, Kent, where instructor Tom Simpson was impressed by his reading and writing abilities and declared his work to be brilliant even at the age of eight. Mr. Simpson said to Richard Balls, Holm Wood didn't shut him down, but they didn't realize what an amazing talent he had. I believe that some of them didn't believe. Was that truly written by an I don't believe it, but since I had seen so much of it in his own handwriting, I did. We have an amazing young man here, and we have got to do something about it, I told the headmaster. I believe Shane had a good final few years at Holmwood, because ultimately the other staff members realized how talented he was. I took a slight stab at Shane's parents had the notion that he would write novels, but the impressionable youngster had different plans. We were aware of his exceptional writing and English skills, Therese remarked. Shane responded, I will, Dad, but not in the way we're talking about, to Maurice's observation that I suppose you probably earn your living as a writer. I will make my living through writing music, as that is how people communicate in this day and age. It is a far more expansive mode of communicating. After receiving a scholarship from Westminster School in London, he left Holmwood 
but was kicked out of the school in his second year for drug possession. He was also admitted to Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London for a period of time when he was 17, which left him with a lifelong phobia of being sectioned. In addition, the family relocated to London's Barbican Apartment Building, a brutalist city that was a far cry from Therese's childhood home of Carney Commons, a rural vid. Shane gained notoriety in 1976 when pink band A Clash performed live and bassist Jane Crockford bid him severely in air. This sparked press articles about cannibalism at the time, trying to fuel the ferocious mood around pink music. Shortly afterward, he became a member of a group named the Nipple Erectors, which then became just the Nips, the Pogue Man, which originated from the anglicization of Pogmothoin, which means Kiss Maya Astrix Astrix Astrix, were established in 1980. After the BBC learned of it and threatened not to broadcast the band's records, it was abbreviated to the Pug. Though the name was a statement of intent, the band's unique selling point was the fusion of Irish and other Celtic folk music. In the end, they covered songs like You and McCall's Dirty Old Town and joined the Dubliners for that classic late-night party hit, The Irish Roll. Brendan Benn, as it turned out, was a major influence in more ways than one, and Shane's own songs typically had a melancholic undertone despite dealing with Irish history, nationalism, and the experience of the diaspora in both Britain and the U.S. The group released five albums, two of which are now considered classics. If I Should Fall From Grace With God, 1987, and Rum Sodomy and the Lash, 1985. But Shane's use of drugs and alcohol during this time caused him to lose his teeth and live a more chaotic life. At the time, it was noted that McGowan and the Pogues as a whole represented everything that the newly middle-class Irish were afraid of as being emblematic of them in England, and everything the reserved English were afraid of about the Irish. In either case, Shane could not have cared less. The journalist Victoria Mary Clark, his wife, once remarked, he doesn't pay any attention to a tan. He's one of those exceptional individuals who doesn't give a damn about what other people think I am. That's very true, and it's a trait I wish I possessed. Being oneself, without fear of being oneself, is one of the greatest things one can possess in life. That is really on. However, there were problems closer to home, as tensions with the other band members were rising. Throughout his live performances, Shane became more unpredictable and had used heroin, LSD, and speed and different points in his life. During a tour in Japan in 1991, when pressure mounted and they asked him to leave, all he could say was, I wonder aloud why it took so long. After being accused of heroin possession by his close friend, Sinead O'Connor in 1999, he was formally cashed at Highbury Corner Magistrates Court in March 2000. There was tension between the two for a while. I adore Shane, declared Sunid, and it enrages me to watch him demolish himself in front of those who care about him out of self-interest. After threatening to sue her and denying ever being an addict, Shane eventually acknowledged that her intervention was one of the first steps toward his recovery. Undoubtedly, he had some astounding experiences when using narcotics. In a film, Crock of Gold, a few rounds with Shane McGowan, Julian Temple talks to his wife and their friend Johnny Depp about his time spent touring New Zealand and staying in a Wellington hotel that was constructed on top of a historic Maori cemetery. He heard Maori warriors ordering him to strip nude and paint himself blue after picking up speed, so he did. He also painted the entire hotel suite blue. They all chuckle hysterically, yet it wasn't humorous at all. That tour, according to the singer's sister Siobhan, was a turning point because he just didn't come back, not the Shane I knew. Shane went on to start a new band called The Popes and was a part of the well-known 1997 rendition of Lou Reed's Perfect Day, which was performed in support of the BBC's Children in Need appeal with several celebrities from various musical genres. Before making a permanent comeback in 2005, he was also back on the road with the Pogues by 2001. He was ranked 50th in the NME magazine's list of rock heroes the following year. He declared to Vice magazine in 2015 that his touring days were o'er. He remarked, I went back, and we grew to hate each other all over again. The band is buddies, so I don't detest them in the slightest. They really appeal to me. Before we joined the band, we were friends for a long time. 
We simply grew a little tired of one another. We're pals as long as we don't tour together, he clarified. I have done an enormous amount of touring. It's plenty for me. In addition to continuing to make sporadic appearances, he and his partner Victoria tied the knot in Copenhagen in 2018 after dating for decades. When they first met at a London pub, she was only 16. Ten years older than McGowan, he approached his bandmate Peter Spider Stacy, introduced himself, and then insisted that she purchase them a few drinks. She informed him where to go, of course, but she was curious. Before they were permanently together, it took them almost four years. She described him as magnet. Upon initially seeing the band, I found them to be quite attractive, and I could have easily done any of their songs. But he was unique because he exuded charisma and commanded attention from everyone in the room. So he's the one you have to watch, even though they're all attractive. Since 2015, Shane has been confined to a wheelchair. The worst thing you can do is break your pelvis, he declared. I need a crutch to walk around the room because I'm lame in one leg. It's taking a very long time, but I am improving. I've had a lot of injuries, and this is the longest I've ever taken to heal. He underwent a nine-hour procedure in 2015 as well to fit a complete set of dental implants. In 2018, as part of a 60th birthday celebration, he also succeeded in completely giving up alcohol. President Michael D. Higgins gave him a Lifetime Achievement Award at the National Concert Hall in Dublin. On New Year's date was 17, tragedy struck the family when Shane's mother Therese passed away at Ballantour, close to Nenagin County, after her car collided with a wall. Temporary. Her age was 87. He loved his mother, Victoria Remark. She was an incredible woman, and without that DNA, Shane would not be the person he is today or have accomplished what he has. She remained incredibly sharp, glamorous, and refined. It's not only Shane's mother, either his father is also quite talented, a composer and writer who speaks Greek and Latin with ease. Both of them are highly literate, including him. Shane must have been pre-programmed to be that way. It's not shocking that he was the way he was. She also talked about living through the height of the troubles in London. The couple frequently felt intimidated since anti-Irish animosity was so prevalent. We would go out for an evening knowing full well that somebody was going to attack at some point, she remarked. It occurred on most evenings. I never truly felt harmed since Shane was a very skilled fighter who exuded courage and had a frighteningly menacing appearance. He was good at frightening them away, so I felt very comfortable with him. That was life in London. It was thrilling and terrifying all the same, like being on a roller coaster and not knowing when to get off. Most of the time, it was like that. Since moving to Dublin a few years ago, Shane's ability to focus has appeared to decline. Julian Temple stated that it might require hours of recording to obtain any usable material from the interviews for the Crock of Gold document. Temple remarked, he made it look like you were setting up cameras in the Siberian night and hoping that the snow leopard might set off the Camry after a few months. For the biography, Richard Balls gave a similar account of the interview procedure. Shane's incoherent memories are interspersed with his signature laugh, TSSCCHH, which resembles someone gargling gravel, the author observed. He dozes off on the recorder at one point, and I have to gently pry it out from under him. Ireland loved Shane more the more vulnerable he appeared, especially during a December 2019 Late Late Show tribute. This was not always the case, though. We also loved other public figures who carried heavy burdens, such as football player George Best, snooker player Alex Higgins, Sunit O'Connor, Dolores O'Riordan, and Christy Dan. Poet Michael O'Loughlin captured it well in the Irish Times, writing about how much he loved the Pogues when he was living in Amsterdam, and how their music allowed him to feel as though the experience of being an immigrant was acknowledged and reflected. He stated, This new Ireland expects its cultural idols to be decent Irish boys and girls, well-read, courteous, and most importantly, middle class. It's as if we're trying to distance ourselves from the previous procession. The same tendency appears to be responsible for the grudging Irish views toward the enormously accomplished guy known as Brendan Benn. In light of all of this, opinions of McGowan are not surprising, even if his songs are timeless and an essential component of this nation's history. 
However, McGowan, in all his imperfect beauty, serves as a continual reminder of the trauma and guilt of an episode, emigration, we have not yet fully come to terms with. At 65 years old, Shane McGowan was well past his prime and peak, but in each of those years he encapsulated the spirit of the London Irish experience and the diaspora in general. Much of his effort may have been rose-tinted nostalgia for a bygone era in the hands of others. McGowan added a much tougher edge to the work, but the lad who grieved every night in England because he yearned to be back in Ireland on the farm might have easily wallowed in that sentimentality for the rest of his life. Many people will use Shane's passing to speculate about what would have happened if he had lived a sober life his entire life. The question that follows is, would he have been Shane at all then? What would he have poured into his songs, which are frequently of astounding poetic beauty, if he hadn't had all of his life experience? Many people today, many of them Irish immigrants, will remember Shane with both great affection and deep sorrow. And maybe they'll pause to consider and ponder a rainy night in Soho, one of his most exquisite tunes. I have loved you for a very long time. Down every day, down every year, I have shed tears for all of your problems. I laughed at your clever little ways. Together, we witnessed our friends grow. And we witnessed them plummet. A few of them made it to heaven. A few of them perished in hell. Shane, on the other hand, might always be on the wrong side of the line and not really care which way he stays.